Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Tim Castleberry, or Timothy, or Timmy O. Call me what you will. But today is Monday, the 25th of July, the year 2016. Today is cloudy, with the chance of rain. If it was going to rain, it would have rained already by now, but I'm thankful. Because it's only 29 degrees Celsius. But the real feel is like 31 degrees Celsius. And the humidity is 69%. Now if I know America, we're the only country in the world that probably uses Fahrenheit. And Fahrenheit is 84 degrees, but it really feels like 88. Which is cool for us here now. And that's that. Here's your weather update. <laughs> And I wanted to use this uh, grapevine. This grapevine was bare when we first started. The prayer call and the POW playlist. I haven't done any POWs in a long time. The Pearls of Wisdom. For those that want to know, PC stands for prayer call or prayer circle. Either or. Um, I watched this thing bear fruit already and a lot of the fruits kind of withered away. But it hasn't really been maintained. You know, you can see a lot of dead stuff on there. Or the heat's really getting to it also, but it's really cool to know this grapevine reminds me a lot of the living vine of Christ. So we're going to do something a little different. I'm walking out of my front yard and we're going to walk to glory. We're going to go on the road or path less traveled than usual. And I think there's a cool moral to this story, if you will. Y'all have watched me walk down by the dogs before, maybe once, maybe twice. I usually don't record before I get there because the dogs are loud. Oh, but you usually will see me start by the Texas flag or by the stop sign. That's after you get to the top of the hill and all the way back down. You know, there's our <laughs> single slant roof, which I find very odd. Oh, and this is where we do the prayer calls in the morning usually. So you can tell if it's noon and the sun's straight up or whatever, but really cool wood pile. It's a lot of wood. And that's where I usually sit my toucus down and do my thing. Real comfortable. The chicken coop on the other side right here. That's Louie, my favorite, most best neighbor. He's like an uncle to me, really. Tio. <laughs> But we're going to go see the horses and the donkeys. Y'all usually say, see me take the easy route. Uh, they always say the quickest way to get from point A to point B is a straight line. Okay, well, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes if you fold point A into point B, you can go straight through and step through. <laughs> you know, that's more like a quantum physics time travel deal, but that's partially true. Sometimes the road less traveled is more dangerous and treacherous, but it's the better path to take. I wish my camera showed the colors better because that orange and blue and gray is really cool. Right there in that little trough of trees. But this is going to be pretty treacherous because it's actually not that far to the horses from my house. I go the long way around because it's the easier path. But today I wanted to add a little venture. And so I'm taking y'all for an adventure. And we're going to cut through the middle. There's no telling what we might see. Last time I went through here, there was a kill zone where there was a carcass. And it was crazy. But it was awesome. And we might trespass on a little bit of private property, but I don't think the people in my neighborhood will mind. And when it rains, it washes out pretty good down here. So this is almost like the beginning of a creek. Now this, for those of you in the bush in Australia, this is perfect prime uh, snake country or snake housing. I've yet to see a snake. And I look forward to the day when I do. I at least haven't seen any yet this year. So... Yeah, welcome to the woods, guys. 
All right, and I'll slowly navigate through here, but it's definitely not a straight line from point A to point B. And we might have to backtrack a little. I try to trespass as little as possible. But where the horses are, she doesn't mind. It's not trespassing. But I don't like to come up too far onto their property and spook the animals. Oh, and it's hard now that everything's grown up to find the right place. But this is the thing. This is the wilderness. This is what life's all about, really. And it's not that wild, considering I can see a telephone pole from here. But it's wild enough. So we're like five, six minutes in, and I haven't really said anything, but... Sometimes, if you want to go the right path, you got to go it on your own. And sometimes, if you take the easy road, it'll just lead you to the same place over and over. You can get really tired of the same things over and over. Well, that's what we call comfort zones. And so many people are comfortable doing the same thing over and over. It becomes... You know, I forget how the saying goes, but it says... When, you're, when your chains of enslavement are too comfortable. That's a beautiful butterfly. It's like bright orange. Uh, can't probably see it with this crappy camera, but... Uh, yeah, when the slave, when the chains of your enslavement become too comfortable, you forget sometimes that you're a slave. And that's the thing is most people don't realize what it is that's holding them back or enslaving them. And it makes me sad. Uh, when you wake up, we talked a little bit about the Matrix yesterday and uh, sleeping, so the Walking Dead, that kind of stuff. And the problem with that is, is that when you get to a point to where you wake up, you see everybody else and you want everybody else to wake up too. Well, it's really hard to wake people up with truth and you're definitely not going to wake them up with a lie. So at what point do you feel like it's your obligation to get them where they need to be? Okay, and I always say if you can't take care of yourself and get yourself where you need to be, how well are you going to be able to help somebody else get there? You know, we've talked about self-love in the last week or two. And it's important to love yourself enough to do right by yourself. And that's what integrity is. Integrity has been like a theme for the last two or three days. Walk in your own integrity, okay? I could get lost out here, but it's really in between one street and another street. How lost could I really get? I'll walk in my integrity. Am I being careful? No, not really. Am I being cautious or diligent? No, not really. Am I sober-minded? Yes. Well, at least I'm halfway there, right? I'm a little focused on talking to y'all. I'm not watching my every move. That's probably not the wisest thing to do, but I'm not too worried about that. Now, if I get bit and I die on here, then... <laughs> uh, I don't know. God help me. Now, see, I could go through that bush right there. Looks pretty thick though. I already got stickers all over me. So let's backtrack. Sometimes to find the best path, you have to go back the way you came. Ow! Take a different route. These are the kinds of walks you don't really want to wear shorts on, but it's too hot not to wear shorts, man. So, this is a cool spot actually. I thought about doing. Oh, come on, buddy. Don't leave me. I thought about doing a couple of the prayer calls up in here because there's some really big stones, boulders, or whatever you want to call them. It's really cool. Nice ambiance. And you hear it's almost always cooler than it is anywhere else because of the shade and whatnot. Now, the road less traveled. There's definitely a lot cooler stuff to look at through here than just walking on the street. I have a couple videos, I think one's called Flowers for the Future and uh, Last of the Flowers and something else. It's about three of them where I just put photographs I took this spring to music and it turned out really cool. I'm kind of feeling this spot actually. But we'll finish, we'll get to the animals like I said, I'll stick to my word. 
that this is a spot I actually thought about doing because all these boulders for this area they're huge it's not normal this is also where snakes like to kick it so uh, there's a property I always hate crossing on their property because I don't know them very well but I don't think they'd mind yeah, well, they can sue me too <laughs> but I had a question in the comments. We're about 10 minutes in, and maybe this is more adventure for me than it is for y'all, but I'm glad y'all could be with me. Um, okay, so the one thing I was asked was about the Holy Ghost, and I thought that was an interesting question. Uh, I remember I used to be into paranormal and supernatural things when I was younger. I still am to a degree. But before I knew as much about the Bible and how it aligned, I was just trying to find the best path to get through this area. Um, and I asked my old youth pastor, Hey, do you believe in ghosts? And he was like, Yes, I believe in one ghost, the Holy Ghost. And I was like, Ooh, good answer, burn. <laughs> but that's not what I was asking. I wanted to know if he seriously knew about ghosts. Ow, that's some thorns. Okay. Okay, so I'm stuck on the thorns. Oh. I'll go a different route. Oh. We won't take the easy way. But yeah, so anyways, he asked about the Holy Ghost. Or I asked about ghosts, and he said, I believe in the Holy Ghost. And I asked him what that meant exactly. He didn't really give a good answer, to be honest. But I had a commenter ask about, is the Holy Ghost separate from God? And I believe the answer to that is yes. I believe that the Holy Ghost um, is mentioned multiple times in the Bible. A lot of people say it's a pagan addition of the Roman Church. And that's not the case from what I could see. Um, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. Right? So you got... God the Father, and He got His only begotten Son in Jesus Christ, and then you have the Holy Ghost. Okay, if you remember in the very beginning in Genesis, it says, um, in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good, and the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Uh, that's, I believe, the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep. But the Holy Spirit's been there since the beginning. And I've heard a couple really cool breakdowns about how that works. Now, when God is one and complete in one, absolutely. Um, you know, the simplest way to do it is mathematics. You can have one, but you can't have zero without a one first. You have to have something before you can have no thing. Okay? Now, if you have one, and you have zero, those are two factors. Okay, so if you have a one, and then you also have a one, now you have three factors. A zero, a one, and a one, but a zero doesn't equate to anything. So if you get real technical, a one and a one can be two separate ones, independent, but yet also conjunctive, where they can add together. And if you add a one and a one, together you get a two. Uh, now you have a two, and you have one left, and you get three. So with these things, I mean, it's real simple, but one, split one into another one, you have two ones. You have a father and you have a son. Okay, so now you have two ones. You add those two together, you don't necessarily negate the one that's always absolutely the same forever, which is God the Father. But now you've added a two to the one and the one combo, so you get two plus one is three. Three to me is the Holy Spirit. Two is Christ and one is the Father. It's real simple in my mind. I and mean, if I could write it down on paper, it wouldn't sound as complicated as what I just said. But when you get that, they're all three, one and the same, but yet they're all separate and individual also. So the Father, if you, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, that's pretty simple. 
Does that mean they're the same thing? No. Uh, the Spirit. Holy Spirit descended down as a dove when Jesus got baptized with water. Okay, one of the interesting things about this Holy Spirit is it said over and over, well, one's baptized in the water, but the one that's to come, that's greater than he, will baptize in the Holy Spirit. Talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit over and over. And uh, in Acts, Paul was asking a group of people, well, did y'all even receive the Holy Ghost whenever you got, or whenever you had faith? And they were like, well, we hadn't even heard that there is a Holy Ghost. <laughs> so, it's not uncommon to not be as familiar with the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God. But at the same time, if you really do a study, just a word study by itself is enough. If you do a word study on the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, or do both, you'll come to find that the Holy Spirit is active in almost every good and godly thing that happens. Ah! Oh, that's some thorns right there, homies. Whew. So when you see this, Holy Spirit. It said over and over, oh, he spoke in the Holy Spirit, or he spoke as the Holy Spirit led, or as the Holy Ghost this and the Holy Ghost that. And so over and over you see the Holy Ghost. He's even mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, we spoke with the Holy Ghost as we learned from Isaiah, or uh, Isaiah, or however you say the, old, the New Testament way of saying the Old Testament name. It was pretty amazing, really, over and over how many times I saw the Holy Ghost pop up. Or the Holy Spirit pop up. Alright. Promised myself I wasn't going to sweat during this one. But I am. <laughs> Bad. Okay. Oh. So, one property away. Close enough. Could have got into the back of the house but like I said I don't like to spook the animals so I'd rather spook the people <laughs> um, so ultimately the Holy Ghost in my opinion based on what I believe that I know that's been revealed to me in the scriptures is the Holy Ghost is what you get okay Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would be the comforter and that he would teach you all that you need to know but he was talking about after he was dead and resurrected. So Pentecost was 40 days after the resurrection, I believe. And the Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came down onto the apostles. Um, and they did great and mighty things once the Spirit came. So that's where the power of God is, is in his Spirit. And I don't know why they had to wait 40 days. I don't know that. But 40 days is over and over a, consi a consistent time period. That's why the last prayer call meetings or videos I did was I tried to get 40 plus days of praying and fasting in a row. And I think we got to 50 something, so that was pretty cool. And there were some amazing things that happened too. Now, we'll try another 40 plus in a row. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Okay, so, yeah, Holy Spirit to me is what happens when you get born again and you get saved, right? When you have faith and you believe in your heart, that faith is what's called circumcision of the heart. You're now having your spirit and your soul separated from your flesh. You're still st stuck in the flesh as the vehicle, but you're not ruled by the flesh anymore. Unless you choose to be. Well, now it becomes a choice, not just an enslavement. But before that, you're enslaved. So, when you break the chains of your enslavement, you have to remember, you got to get up and go walk with God to get out of your situation. So, Holy Spirit comes down. I think the second you're born again, Jesus comes and dwells in your heart. And from that point... You have the Holy Spirit. Now what do you do with the Holy Spirit it's between you and your personal walk and relationship with God? And there's things called fruits of the Spirit. If you don't have the fruits of the Spirit, well then you're not uh, as mature as you could be. I'll put it that way. Um, 
<laughs> it's not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing. You don't want to be, uh, I guess the word is atrophy. You don't want things to wither away. And it's a lot easier to backslide if your relationship's dwindling with God. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not in the spiritual condition God would want you to be in. And it's probably not the one you want to be in either. So, I guess that's that. The Holy Spirit, I think when you get born again and you're saved, that's being baptized in the Spirit. You don't have to be baptized in the water to be saved. That's more like, the way it was put to me was, when you're saved and born again, you get married to Christ. And so we're referred to as the Bride of Christ. When you get baptized in the water, that's a outward symbol of being born again. So it would be the same thing as putting on a wedding ring. You don't have to have a ring to prove you're married. But when you get baptized, that's like putting on a spiritual wedding ring to Christ. A wedding ring doesn't, doesn't marry you, so neither does baptism. It's an outward expression. Now before Christ came, it was an outward expression of repentance. And that was the best thing you could do back then after having faith. And I would say it's probably still the best thing you can do now after having faith. So have faith, be baptized in the water, but know the moment that you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside you. And I think one of the scriptures says, do you not know that your body's the, the temple for the Holy Spirit? So your heart's like the Holy of Holies. Your body is like the temple of God. And the Holy Spirit is His glory that comes down and rests inside of you. That's where your power comes from. If you want to talk about having spiritual power, God gives you the power of Christ through the shedding of the blood, but also through the remission of sin. Okay, that, that's, that blood's what gets rid of the sin. Now the Holy Spirit can move and can hover over the face of your deep. Okay, so keep those things in mind. Um, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, I think that's when you're born again. I could be wrong, and I know there's probably theologians that disagree, but, you know, that's my take on it. That's my two cents, and until someone shows me differently, that's where I stand on it. So, if you don't know the Holy Ghost, then how are you going to be able to activate it or work with it, you know? So when Paul's asking those guys, well, did y'all even get the Holy Ghost when you got faith? And they're like, well, we hadn't even been told there is a Holy Ghost. So if you're not told, there's no way you can know. And if you don't ask, how can you know? So I appreciate the ask, and I appreciate the question. I appreciate being able to tell what I believe and sharing it and scripture I believe backs up what I'm sharing so but I don't know everything and I could be wrong I always leave that option open on the table too uh, so having said all that it's now time to get down to the nitty-gritty okay so I probably look a little nitty-gritty now but it is what it is and we'll read the devotional for the evening first. And I have no idea what the devotionals are going to be about, so hopefully they'll tie in, but it's not going to break my heart if they don't. Um, Holy Spirit's one of the most important things there is. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit's the only thing you can't be forgiven for. Maybe next to taking the mark of the beast, but that's apples and oranges, really. So, sin is sin. The Holy Spirit is it has a lot of different names, but the Comforter and the Teacher, those are two things that are real important. The, the Holy Spirit comforts you, so ask for that comfort of the Holy Spirit when you need to. And when you're not knowing something or you're not 100% sure, and you're just praying to God generically, hey, you know, give me some understanding, ask specifically the Holy Spirit to teach you, because that's the third component part of God Himself. Um, I won't go there with that, but yeah, so there's more things I could say, but it's a little more controversial, so, and I'm not as well studied on it, and I don't want to open that can of worms tonight, so, uh, Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 says, in their affliction they will seek me early, okay, it came out a little earlier today, I don't think that's what it's talking about though, okay, uh, Losses and adversities are frequently the means by which the great shepherd uses to fetch home his wandering sheep. Like fierce dogs, they worry the wanderers back to the fold. 
There is no making lions tame if they are too well fed. They must be brought down from their great strength, and their stomachs must be lowered. And then they will submit to the tamer's hand, and often have we seen the Christian rendered obedient to the Lord's will by straightness of bread and hard labor. When rich and increased in goods, many professors carry their heads much too loftily and speak exceedingly boast or speak exceeding boastfully. Okay, boastfully is bragging. Carrying their heads too loftily is too high. Professors, it's not talking about your college professors, it's talking about self-professing Christians or professors of the faith. Um, so, yeah. When the Christians... Yeah, when rich and increased in goods, many professors. Um, when you got the easy life, it's easy to... Be easy. <laughs> um, okay, so when the Christian grows wealthy, is in good repute, has good health and a happy family, he too often admits Mr. Carnal security to feast at his table. And then, if he be a true child of God, there is a rod preparing for him. Wait a while, and it may be you will see his substance melt away as a dream. There goes a portion of his estate, how soon the acres change hands. That debt, that dishonored bill, how fast his losses roll in, where will they end? It's a blessed sign of divine life when there, or when these embarrassments occur one after another, he begins to be distressed about his backslidings and betakes himself to God. Okay, I got something crazy about this. Uh, blessed are the waves that wash the mariner upon the rock of salvation. Losses and business are often sanctified to our soul's enriching. If the chosen soul will not come to the Lord full-handed, it shall come empty. If God in His grace finds no other means of making us honor Him among men, He will cast us into the deep, and if we fail to honor Him on the pinnacle of riches, He will bring us into the valley of poverty. Yet faint not, heir of sorrow, and heir is like an uh, inheritance heir. So faint not, heir of sorrow. I lost my spot like I always do. Um, okay, if God in His grace finds no other means of making us honor Him among men, He will cast us into the deep, and if we fail to honor Him on the pinnacle of riches, He will bring us to the valley of poverty. Yet faint not, heir of sorrow, when you are thus rebuked, rather recognize the loving hand which chastens and say, I will arise and go unto my father. That's cool. Um, I've had in my life calamity after calamity after calamity. And uh, we just always called it the Castleberry Curse. But we always thought that, hey, this is just the way of things for this family. So we got used to the normal things people shouldn't ever have to get used to. And my life hasn't been horrible, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people with it worse off than I've got it, or had it. Um, but there is a pattern to these things. And if you're a fool, then yeah, these things are going to keep happening. Because you don't ever get wise to the root cause, or you don't ever change... Um, you don't blaze a new path out of that comfort zone. That's important to note. And so I find it interesting with that message he just gave. Um, that today was the day I chose to go blaze the trail through here. Uh, you know, I got thorns and stickers in me right now. My hair has probably got all kinds of crap in it. I don't really care about any of that. And I didn't care when I decided to do it. And it was more like proving a point, I guess, is that it could go the easy way here every time. But what is there to be gained from that? You know, I'm not saying gaining thorns in your leg is good, but... Um, I had fun. <laughs> and I wouldn't be sweating now if I hadn't done that, but... You know, some things are worth working harder for. And some things are worth making a point and proving the point. Um, man, it's, it's, I'll go back and read just a little bit again, but when he's talking about in, in particular, 
the afflictions, right? In our afflictions, uh, the one that stuck out to me was the Mariner. There's a bunch of times uh, when a boat gets capsized in wrecks, and then what happens to the survivors, that's always an interesting story, because there's nothing to survive on out in the ocean. So how do you make it, you know? You always see the movies where they, you know, they're on the raft for, you know, a long time, or they get washed ashore, you know, like Caruso or whatever. Um, how do they make it? Castaway, Wilson, right? How do they make it when they're out there on their own figuring out how to go back to the primitive way man used to be? Uh, I always think those stories are cool, but they always find themselves in those processes. They always become the person they should have been originally. And it took them almost losing their life or livelihood. And most of them did lose their livelihoods, but... You know, the point he was making is that if you got the easy life, then what glory is there for God? Now, I've made this point before, but if we're in war, which in spiritual warfare, that's what we're in. If we're in war and you never have to fight a battle or lift your finger, how much glory is there in the victory? Yeah, we already got the victory in Christ. Um, the war is won, but we got a lot of battles to fight before we get to that point in time. Um... I think about my military experience, it was not very glorified, uh, there was not much glory in my volunteering, but um, if you go as an, infantry, as an infantryman and you expect to be in the infantry and you expect to fight the, the fight on the ground level in a pair of boots, maybe a ride, maybe not, you know, like you want to fight the biggest, baddest battle ever, so when you get done and you actually survive, you can be like, yeah, look what I did, or look where I went and came back from, you know. How many people didn't come back from storming the beaches of Normandy in World War II? Or how many people didn't make it back from Vietnam? You know, questionable conflict at that. Uh, how many people didn't make it out of Korea or World War I? And a number of other... Um, conflicts or military operations how many people didn't come back so if you do survive there's a glory in that right uh, glory for battle and victory even to lose and, and still live you know there's a glory in that as a warrior the glory of battle is one of the best things that you can have but do you glory for yourself or do you glory for God you know and when you look at a spiritual war how much glory is there in battles you don't even fight or where there's no struggle you know, when we went into the Gulf War I, um, I think the Iraqis, like, surrendered within 24-hour period of actual, like, boots on the ground fighting. How much glory is there in that when your whole enemy army just gives up and says, Hey, please take my weapons. Please take me hostage. You know, that's not really a hard-fought battle. Um, <laughs> back in the old days, they would call that a lot of things not good, so... I think about the mariner getting uh, tossed to and fro and finding God in the process or somebody who's had a hard life and has had affliction stacked on top of affliction uh, or I look at the people having the easy life and I think from the other end of the spectrum man it would have been a lot could have done a lot more for God if I had all this money or I could have done a lot more for God if I had a facility uh, there's a lot of things like that where you think to yourself woulda, coulda, shoulda, what if, what if, okay, well, God will give you what you need when you need it, and God will provide for you your the desires of your heart if they're aligned with what He wants for you, with you. Patience might be a virtue. If it wasn't a virtue, then everybody would have it, right? So to be virtuous and to be in your integrity and to have morals and values, those are all important things. And God weighs your heart. He doesn't weigh your pocketbook or your bank account. You know? Um, God weighs your your soul and your spirit and your heart and your mind. Those are the things that matter to Him the most. Not how big your house is or what kind of car you drive. Not if you know so-and-so and, -so and fancy-foo-foo. God doesn't care about that. And if anything, you only know those people because God put them in your life. We don't give God very much credit sometimes, and it's nuts to me when you actually think how sovereign and completely in control He is of everything. It gives me a lot of faith to know that as bad as this world is and is getting, and how bad off it's going to be, uh, when it hits the fan and all that stuff, I don't care. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't care. Um, 
I only care about God. And if God told us it was going to be this way, then of course, you know, it hurts me that other people are going to be hurting. It hurts about the death and destruction and famine and pestilence and plague and earthquakes in diverse places and wars and rumors of wars and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all that stuff sucks really bad. But what doesn't suck is God, right? And if God told us ahead of time, shouldn't we kind of be like, uh, hey, kind of expected it a little bit? Uh, I got the memo, right? How many people don't have the memo? How many people have getting, been trying to help other people get prepared for it only to fall on deaf ears and people who don't really care? Or people who think you're crazy for caring? And I'm not saying don't care, and I'm not saying give up on people, and I'm not saying, hey, close the door to humanity, and God's going to take care of every single little thing. I mean, He can, and He probably will on some degree, but... Be accountable and responsible for most of your own stuff, but at the same time, that doesn't mean you have to hole and shell up against everybody else. Be that neighbor and be that compassionate uh, lover of Christ that shares the love with others. Love your enemies, all those things. So don't run away from the doctrine that's sound and the teachings that are good and the applications in your life that make you a better person and a better follower of Christ. You're going to you're going to make everybody else's life better around you. And if they don't get that, then they're going to go away from you. And maybe that's, if you love something, you let it go. And if it comes back, it's real love or whatever, however that saying goes. Same thing here. You know, if you tell somebody the truth, they might receive it. They might not. That's where Proverbs come in. We've talked a lot about the Proverbs and they've talked about a fit answer. You know, make your answer fit at the right place at the right time. That's what I would say. So, I mean, I could talk a lot about this, really. The end times is a pretty serious topic. Maybe we'll cover that later. It's not everything I want to get into today, but... Um, how many of the crowd would have wanted to go through that with me to get here? Y'all see me walk on the paved road, and it's a lot easier that way, right? How many people would want to walk with me through that to get here to do this? You know? Y'all got to vicariously do it watching the video, but... That's a little different than getting the thorn in your ass. <laughs> you know, getting hung up in the uh, the flowerless rose bush, which I don't even understand how that's a possibility. But the ground's cursed for our sake, and sometimes it can be good if we let it be. Sometimes even getting poked with things can be fun if you don't focus on the pain, you know. Uh, yeah, so got a little blood, man. A little blood never hurt nobody. Actually, a little blood saved the whole world, so... <laughs> Anyways, I'll quit grandstanding over here. Today is 25th, I think. For some reason, I keep thinking it's the 26th. This is like the fourth time I check my phone, so... Yeah, 25th. of this July. Monday. Evening. Uh, Psalm 25. Unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in you, and let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yes, let none that wait on you be ashamed, and let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you do I wait all the day. Remember, O oh Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember you, me. For your goodness' sake, O oh Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way, the meek, will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Let me read that one more time, because I'm seeing a lot of that lacking in the, in the body of Christ these days. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Truth might hurt, but where's the mercy in giving inconvenient truths? Mercy is the key word. 
we know God's true and and tried and trustworthy and cannot lie and all those things but mercy is the thing that is most important because none of us deserve it and anybody who believes on Christ will receive it unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies so all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies for your name's sake O Lord pardon my iniquity for it is great and what man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Keep hearing teach over and over, and I keep thinking Holy Spirit, by the way. So, His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn you unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring you me out of the distresses, or out of my distresses. Look upon my afflictions and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many. And they hate me with cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all of his troubles. Whew. That psalm blew my mind compared to what uh, Mr. Spurgeon said and the commentary I gave on the way here and the Holy Spirit answers and the things we've talked about in the last couple days my mind's blown guys wow so I'm just gonna pray real quick and I'm actually gonna pray using if I can only the words of Psalm the Psalm itself Sometimes I like to read scripture backwards. Not completely backwards, but you'll see what I mean. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to come together. And thank you for this Psalm of David. That we can use this as our prayer. If it was good for David, it's good for us. And if you accepted David as a man after your own heart, then receive this prayer as a prayer also after your own heart. Father God, let integrity and uprightness preserve us, for we wait on you. And redeem us, O God, out of all of our troubles. Keep our souls and deliver us, and let us not be ashamed, for we put our trust in you, Father God. Consider our enemies, for they are many, and they hate us with cruel hatred. And forgive us all our sins, and look upon our afflictions and our pain, God, because you know our hearts. The troubles of our hearts are enlarged and bring us out of our distresses. Turn us not unto ourselves, but have mercy upon us that we may be turned unto you. Our eyes are ever towards you, Lord, for you will pluck our feet out of the nets and snares of our enemies. Father God, the secret of the Lord is with us that fear you and that know you and that respect you. Your soul shall dwell at ease, God, when your fullness is made to completion and as we wait for that complete fullness of the time that you have appointed we ask that you rest our souls at ease as we abide in you and that our seed as the meek will inherit the earth god as you've promised what is man or woman that fears the lord god you know us who are we that we can even know you your ways are so far above ours You will teach us the ways that you shall choose, God, so that we can be walking in your footsteps, walking in your grace and your mercy and your will. For your name's sake, O Lord, please pardon our iniquity, for our iniquities have been great and our sin has abounded in our lives. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, God, and keep us in your covenant and with your testimony. And please help guide the meek in judgment and help teach the meek your ways, God. For you are upright, and therefore you will teach sinners in your way. You will teach us how to be upright, God. Show us. And remember not the sins of our youth, 
neither remember our transgressions of our older age. According to your mercy, remember us. And remember where our hearts were then and where they are now, God. Remember, O Lord, with your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. And lead us into the, your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and on you do we wait all day, every day. Show us your ways, O Lord, and teach us your paths. And let them be ashamed which transgress against us, but let us forgive those who transgress and trespass against us, as you have forgiven our transgressions and our trespasses. And let none wait on you, let none that wait on you, Father God, be ashamed. Let us never be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And let none that wait on you be ashamed as they're waiting in patience. And give us that virtue of patience, God. Let not our enemies triumph over us. And God, we trust in you. Let us not be ashamed. And unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And all these things we offer to you in prayer and in thanksgiving and in love and in kindness and meekness and the authority and power of the blood of Christ. All these things we pray in his holy name for your edification, Father God. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.